Hello and welcome to On Point, which is NatWest's exciting new podcast series on the big topics for corporate institutions. I'm Andrew Blinkham, the head of corporate institutions here at NatWest, and I'm absolutely delighted you can join us. Uh, in this episode, I was really pleased to speak with Alex Ashby. He's the head of the markets group at Tesco, and with John Nicholas, who's the senior advisor at Treasury today. We talked about what it takes to craft a successful sustainability strategy, and then how to embed ESG considerations within Treasury. So perhaps I can start by asking Andrew our first question. Andrew, in a recent poll of our readers, liquidity and funding were identified as the most popular areas where corporates are actively trying to integrate ESG criteria. What are some of the main factors you think have helped your clients succeed here? I think um, most popular areas, I think it's probably both not only most popular areas, but also the areas that have ended up taking the most time as well. And I think my overriding observation would be it's about being um, specific and it's about being tailored and focused for, for the customer in question. Uh, I think we, we've seen lots of, uh, you know, we tend to have lots of questions around whether is it, um, is there a sort of one size fits all uh, answer to how to, how to um, access um, ESG link financing? Is there a is there a common set of standards? And, and the answer to think where we've seen it most successfully done is where our customers have done it in a way that one is fully embedded with their other strategic priorities and their other other funding uh, requirements and and their broader you know treasury and, and and finance objectives, but also one that really looks at and understands. Uh, how to then both sequence it and how to build it out and make it work for them. So that in many cases has meant thinking about which markets to access first. It's that meant about is it's in many cases meant engaging with different investor communities ahead of time. And it's and it's been really, I, I guess, probably a, a key point as well. It's it's again where it's really been thought of and integrated in in the broader sort of budget and strategic planning uh, on on uh, on on the side of the of the customer as well. I think when those factors have come together, that, that's when we've seen it be be most successful. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So Alex, what, what is your experience of ESG factors in the liquidity and funding areas at Tesco? Sure, thanks, John. And again, welcome to everyone today. Um, absolutely, I mean, I think we, 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 we've uh, aligned a lot with what Andrew said, actually. I absolutely agree with the mantra of going with the grain and the strategy of the business. That's absolutely the right thing to do. And that's literally what we've been doing in, in, in the treasury team at Tesco. Um, I mean, a few years ago, we came up with the idea, probably slightly badly named now, of a green financing framework. It probably should be something a bit more uh, sustainability focused now. But anyway, that, at the time, that was the kind of language we were using a few years back. And we thought, right, OK, we really want to go for this. OK, so me, the treasurer and some of the other team got together, worked this through. And we thought, right, how, how can we land this? How can we do this? You know, others were doing it. There were a few yeah, at that time. There were, there were a few a few examples in existence, but not many. OK, so. We thought we'd start off with our revolving credit facility. Um, the idea being, you know, that's that's between us and the bank group with, with Andrew and our other partners and, and that West and so on. Um, and we thought, right, okay, well, look, what we want to do is first of all demonstrate that Tesco is living and breathing by its own KPIs that we've set. And, we're, and we're, in essence, we're, we're you know we're, we're 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 sort of living living those through our financing ourselves. So we had um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, no food waste, safe for human consumption. And then renewable energy is something I'm, I'm actually personally leading for Tesco. So those are the three KPIs we came up with as the kind of most appropriate, mature. And obviously we talked to a number of investors and others around what were the most appropriate ones, but also which ones were more mature from a data perspective. You need to be able to obviously have confidence in how you report on these all the way out to potentially quite long time frames for an RCF if it's, you know, three, four, five yeah. years with the extensions, you know. Um, Similarly, we followed that up and we did then went to the market and did our first sustainability link bond in January 21. Um, I think that was the first for an LSE corporate, not the first in the market, but again, quite an early, early adopter. Um, and we used the greenhouse gas emissions there again, talking to our investors and others. That was absolutely sort of the headline KPI for most people that, that, that came to mind. So we've got a 60% reduction versus a 2015 baseline by 2025, which worked quite nicely for, uh, for, for an eight year assurance. Then we've done a further extension of that, and this is always intended as part of this framework we came up with, which is actually having a look at our supply base. And we've actually recently relaunched our UK supply chain finance offering. And this is something that enables suppliers to get paid 
earlier on their invoices. It's totally optional, but they do it at a very low cost of funding through um, uh, you know, th through the financing behind um, behind the facility from from NatWest and our other banks. So what we did here is we linked a climate based assessment again, kind of greenhouse gas focused for suppliers. They fill in a questionnaire annually, and they're able if they do well to get into different tiers, and they can achieve up to twenty percent lower lower financing costs if they're able to do that. So that was a UK first we did in April. So overall, pretty good. We've kind of come to the end of that, and I guess now in actual fact, I mean, we're probably looking at what's next and what else can go beyond there. But that was something we started off a few years ago. We've recently come come to the end of, and hopefully, it's quite a good example of how one can think through up front. You know, what you want to do. Start with the company. Start with yourselves, and then work it through. Uh, you know, your investors and and then and then suppliers. So to talk a little bit more about how how you're incentivizing your supply chain to to come to the table as it were around some of these initiatives sure yeah absolutely i mean in that example i mean it's an optional financing facility but ultimately those that um have set challenging targets and are making progress there you know if they're already using it they're, they're just going to receive a reduction in in financing costs and hopefully that then enables you know that, that that's a great message for me to, to, to execs and boards to then continue that investment and but for me, the best the best piece really is someone who hasn't started it. We've had a number of suppliers talk to us and go, "Oh, okay. Well, how can we start this? How do we get yeah, started?" Yeah, yeah. You know, we've created a whole kind of landing page on our supplier portal for tools to get started to do your own, um, you know, carbon calculators, all that kind of stuff, as well wow. as consultants. So, what 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 sort of percentage of your supply chain is is uh, involved in this? Um, so, the, at the moment, we've got about 200, 250 suppliers. So that's about only about 10 uh, percent but we've got quite a lot of um sizable suppliers there in terms of um mm. you know private label and so on and as i said this is a very recent launch it went live yes, uh, yes. 20 days ago so we're now actively marketing and we plan to grow that extensively across the supply chain we've had loads of interest from our supply base so far what we've been doing is rating the people that were currently on it prior to the launch and now we're actively working to let it grow okay 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 in a, in a similar poll andrew monitoring and reporting was cited as the most challenging when it comes to a company's ESG strategy. What advice would you give to corporates experiencing such challenges? And what regulations and frameworks should they consider as they flesh out this part of their ESG strategy? Thanks, Ron. So it's a, a, a really, uh, really good question. Uh, and I think probably uh, perhaps slightly frustrating. I'd, I'd start by saying, I think we need to be careful not to treat all investors as the same. There are different investors, different asset classes, different types of investors. So I, I think sort of seeking a holy grail or, or, or thinking that there will be a holy grail of a single set of reporting criteria that works for each of those investor groups. I think we are, um, will be um, disappointed if uh, if that's an aspiration that people are, are talking. So I think that the first thing I'd say is it's really, important to recognize different investor groups will have different um different um uh, hot topics or, or, or different needs and different requirements as well driven in part by either regulation or, or or sort of prevailing um you know considerations within within their own part of the market uh, i think i'd also say it, it's not the case that there is a, a precise playbook by investor type either i think um where again we found um I think the most satis satisfying outcomes for the, you know, our, our clients and our customers that we've worked with has been where we've worked proactively and, and constructively to engage with either individual investors or investor classes to help make sure that there is, uh, there's, there's an appropriate framework and appropriate set of KPIs that not only reflect and, and work for the customer, but then also allow that investor group to, to meet their needs as well. So I think it, it's, uh, a, a degree. I think it's important to remember that a degree of tailoring is is possible and is uh, is indeed appropriate, uh, particularly for you know the the, the larger the issuer as well. Um, I'd probably finish by re-emphasising a couple of points as well. I think it is really important to think about it in the context of other reporting requirements as well. ESG is, is and sustainability is is absolutely at the core of. Um, you know, of, of, of um, you know, where I think markets are moving. So seeing it as part of rather than as, a, as an appendix to or something that's separate to the rest of, of, uh, of, of your reporting requirements is probably embedding um, a tougher journey going forward. And it's embedding a, a, a probably more, uh, a less integrated and a clunkier reporting process going forward. So I think investing the time early to make sure 
that there is alignment between and, and consistency between ESG reporting and, and other reporting cycles, I, I think is, is time well spent. Uh, and as I said as well, I also think there is there is a real opportunity and, and, and it's uh, we've tended to see the best results when there's been, uh, if you like, pre-sounding or, or an active and constructive engagement with, with uh, certainly key investor groups ahead of either launch or formal approach to a market as well. Again, I think that we've seen that pay off um, sort of many times over. Okay, I, I won't ask you, Alex, if you have KPIs, because uh, quite clearly you do. You've referenced them already. But how is reporting against ESG measures handled at Tesco more broad, in a more broad sense? Sure, no, thanks, John. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think just, just to echo, I mean, we've had KPIs going back to, to pre-2008. I think one of our energy KPIs started in 2005. So just to give an example, you know, wow. it's not new. I think part of what we're doing with this whole revamp and ESG and all the different buzzwords that come with it, you know, we're really reforming and trying to centralise to what Andrew was saying to make it more visible, to be honest. A lot of businesses have been doing a lot of this stuff already. I mean, you know, we, we've reformed and included, um, um, you know, everything we do in a sustainability report in the last two, three years called the Little Helps Plan, which we've been doing very successfully. But actually, to Andrew's point, we've actually started in increasing the number of those that are reported in the actual annual report. And the reason being is obviously there's a, there's a differing level of assurance there. So bringing in that comfort for investors that would, you know, by having it, having it there, having it part of the audit and so forth. So that's a really important consideration as well, I'd say, is to make sure you think about through where and how you're showing it, as, as Andrew rightly said. But yeah, in terms of what we do, um, we've, we've got quite, quite a lot of KPIs. So we've brought them together really under, under key pillars. I think that's quite common for, for large, large companies. And ultimately, we need to make some of these topics quite understandable. You know, if you go and walk into, walk into a Tesco Express and ask the average consumer about these, some will be very well versed, some won't. You know, that's, that's, just, that's just a fact. So you need to be able to really, um, really simply convey quite complex messaging sometimes when it's deforestation or what have you, or renewable energy mm. sourcing. These are not simple topics um, once you get away from, from signing up with, uh, with, with energy supply. So we've got core pillars of people, you know, we're a huge employer, human rights and our clothing supply chain, all that stuff, et cetera. Products at the core of what we do, you know, buying, buying, um, buying produce, where we get it from, sustainability there. Um, packaging as well, um, really topical. You know, we've removed a billion pieces of packaging over the last two years, massive success, but that's only the start of what we aim to do there. Planet, I've talked about quite a bit, greenhouse gas, environment, um, and also sustainable agriculture, you know, as, as one of the biggest um, buyers of, of, of agriculture in the UK. And finally, places, you know, we need to be mindful, you know, we are absolutely spread across multiple um, jurisdictions, countries, and communities, partnerships, and as well as, you know, redistributing food and um, getting that to food banks and all the collections we do, as well as local investments from, from Banks for Life and so on. You know, those all come together, hopefully, to form a relatively coherent map of what Tesco does and where it touches the world, mm -hmm. grouped into four um, in, into four pillars. And how does how does the Treasury function engage with Tesco's marketing and comms people to make sure that these messages are getting out to the consumer? That's a great question. I think I think as I said, because we started this this whole framework really early on. I think we, I think as I say, fair to say. I mean, from, from their own words, we're one of the closest teams they work with. Bizarrely, which one may not think that your comms and you know, CSR or sustainability teams, you know, we literally talk every day now just because we started this off early on. And I think it's fantastic. You know, we've got a great relationship with them, something that they would happily uh, admit to if they're on the call, I hope. As well. so, you know, I, th I think really what we do, you know, we are one of the ways of amplifying that message. You know what I mean? At, at the moment, financing is such a great way of getting things out there. It's very topical. It's quite easy to get a business case together because one can talk about, um, you know, increased investor demand, helping there be a soft saving on some of the financing products in there. So it's just a great way of getting it out there. And similarly, we're also heavily involved in renewable energy and various other actual aspects of delivering this sustainability strategy. We're not just raising debt on some KPIs, we are actively leading parts of it. So I think from those two, two, two areas, we've really got really close and just have a fantastic working relationship to, to amplify what's already being done um, you know, inside the business. Just referencing back to, to Alex and, and the Tesco supply chain, obviously it's an extensive supply chain. Um, do you want to say a bit more about how you address sustainability here and what are the key challenges for you? Yeah, sure, John. Well, just first of all, I might just frame the problem. I mean, there's been quite a lot of studies done. I mean, if all of the kind of RE100 large corporates hit their targets, even in the UK, we still miss net zero. Okay, so look, supply chains have to ultimately be heavily involved in this. And, you know, it's fantastic that people are leading and setting challenging targets. 
we have to solve and help supply chains get there. And they're not all listed companies. You know, a lot of them are, a lot of our suppliers are medium, small caps, some are startups. You know, we have to figure a way of working out and helping them get there. Otherwise, we're never going to achieve what we need to um, as a country or, or globally. So just to give that context and my perspective there. But I mean, as I said to you, we're already looking, you know, we're very active in renewable, renewable energy. We're trying to help our suppliers there. It's hard because there's a kind of credit question in terms of signing long-term contracts and, and, and offtake. So we're trying to help solve that with our partners. Um, we've got a variety of toolkits and supports we offer. You know, we try and set standards and help with them. We offer a whole, there's a, there's a very complicated tool, supplier toolkit at Tesco with about 50 pages of advice. And to be honest, the number of those that have links to sustainability is growing almost exponentially in terms of um, the impacts and how we see it all the way through from I don't know, pesticide use all the way through to, to, to renewable energy. And, you know, we've got a few initiatives. I mentioned the supply chain finance, you know, we've got um, in terms of other uh, other areas, you know, we've got an incubator for <coughs> startups. And, uh, there are 10 in there at the moment. I can tell you, I think most of them have some kind of sustainability linkage in them, which is fantastic. And that's not required. That's that's just the, the flavor of the time. So by helping those grows, you know, one of them's sustainable pet food is fantastic. Hopefully they grow and get bigger and bigger and, and off we go. So I think there's there's a lot of breadth of what we do. We're such a big business. It's actually quite hard to get your arms around um, everything that we do. But yeah. in terms of working it through, that's probably a few good examples. I mean, we had a last one, we had a vertical farming trial, if anyone saw that, for strawberries in the south of England, which, which we did a few months ago, which is fantastic, you know, growing more British and, and trying to work through that technology to see how it works you know it's still early early stages but by us helping and working with suppliers and and, and giving them you know a surety we're going to go and buy those strawberries and market them with them you know to, to, to customers it enables things to move on a bit hopefully what would you say are the key factors for a successful esg journey andrew uh i'm i'm, I'm probably going to be at risk of um of of repeating um but, you know what i said earlier I, but pr probably three things i think investing time up front and um making sure and, and seeing it as an integrated part of of you know the the, the broader activities it, it's not an activity on the side it's not an addition it is a core part and i think alex has has again talked very clearly to both the time he spends on it and, and how it's integrated um in across uh on on their side um be collaborative i think it's um you know both across divisions and across teams internally with with your financing partners with your different markets you engage with and indeed with your supply chain and, and elsewhere i think it goes that goes very much to the point around how we're going to you know to collectively win and it being a, a, a collective ambition I, I think the other couple of things I'd, I'd say as well is i think taking ownership is really important for, from the customer side as well i think there are there's a real um challenge there's a real risk for customers that don't aren't looking to drive their own agenda and aren't, aren't, aren't seeking to, if you like, um, help set the, their own pace, that, that there is a real risk that it then ends up getting set by others as well. So as I say, I think that that time spent up front engaging with different stakeholder groups, engaging with investor groups, engaging with supply chain, and al allows and affords the a much better opportunity to make sure an ESG um, framework and set of targets and, and ambition and, and ultimately success is defined on terms that, that that are appropriate and most effective for that customer, and there definitely isn't a isn't a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. I think we'd also say, as with I think most things in our job, it it is a little bit like painting the you know the the, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, or whatever it is. It's, it's a job that's never done. I think when you get to the end of that, whatever's currently on your stack, it's sort of back to the start and and, and keep going and, and go again. Is it's important to understand? I think that it's not something that is a task to be done. It's a, it's a core part of our of, a, of our ongoing, you know, operations and processes and, and, and thought process and you know, bit reporting or otherwise, um, and I think that the, the the last thing I'd say is is um, don't be afraid to be ambitious. I think uh, I think it's something in that West we've we've been really proud of as well. Both you know, obviously sort of coming up as a as a principal partner of COP, but in terms of both how we the, the targets we set for our own ambitions, uh, sorry for our own operations, the the, the targets we, we've looked to set for the impact our financing has. Uh, you know, and the emissions effect that our own financing has as well. That they're, that they're re I think it's really important to be ambitious, to be bold, and then you know to be clear and and uh, and uh, reflect progress against that. And, and as I say, to continue to learn along the way because it is a it's a part of the market, it's a part of our operations that continues to evolve, it continues to to change. So I think it's super important to you know to have the uh, you know that 
consistent sense of reflection as well to see how it's going to listen to engage with others and and, and to keep resetting and, and regoing. Okay. Alex, anything to uh, add to that from the corporate side? Yeah, no, well, I disagree again, largely with Andrew. I think, yeah, absolutely. Anyone setting out on this, I mean, you know, do your research, chat to your, your banks, your advisors, investors, but, but don't forget your, your customers, your suppliers, you know, you know, that this is a broad topic and it's great to canvas understand what everyone is doing because, you know, through partnership, you can achieve an awful lot more than you can, you can alone. But yeah, definitely mm -hmm. be ambitious and understand that. One of the things we found is really helpful. It's quite maybe a little bit more on the mundane side, but do you think about data? You know, if you're setting out some of these targets, I don't know, like for us, food waste, I mean, if you think about that, it permeates almost everything we do. You know what I mean? You've got to try and add up every store, what they're throwing away, what they're not, what they're giving away to charities, what, what's reduced and sold. You know, it's, it's such a big topic. And that's just one guy to give an example. So one thing we found really helpful is getting your finance function, not really treasury, but, you know, getting the finance function there central and helping and supportive. OK, because for me, a lot of these sustainability teams I know from other corporates, they're generally kind of teams that have grown and grown quite considerably the last few years, but actually... There's a little bit more integration that can be done, particularly through through finance or IR or treasury. You know, I think something we've we've managed to do quite well, but you know, we could easily have done it a little bit earlier as well, to be honest, on, on reflection. So I think for me, think about that and think about establishing yourself and all that infrastructure early. It's almost like having a new business unit, if that makes sense, in terms of how you should see it or think about it in scale. And if you had a new business unit, you go, right, who's my business partner? Who helps with this? Who helps with comms? You know, and, and, and absolutely we've got individuals almost in each team, now comms, IR, tax, et cetera, that, that help manage these um, these aspects. So definitely think about that. But yeah, in terms of the opportunity for, for what, what's out there, we need to be challenging, we need to be far reaching. So to Andrew's point, don't be afraid. You know, I think this is something that, you know, there's gonna be quite a few, should we say, I don't use the word failures, but there'll be quite a few, should we say changes of strategy over, over the next 10, 15 years. That's a given, it's, it's, it's those companies that are brave enough to start that journey that will help move and help, help achieve it. Hi, Andrew Blinko again. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of On Point. Please do subscribe to our channel to get future episodes or indeed navigate to ci.natwest.com for the latest updates on what's moving markets and a series of, we hope, really interesting articles that will um, uh, keep you updated. We'd also really encourage you to follow us on social media. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Twitter and of course LinkedIn to get all our latest content. Look forward to speaking soon.